to the opening ceremony of the 42nd World Hospital Congress, or as we say down under, g'day. In Australia, as a sign of respect and acknowledgement for the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet, we have a welcome to country ceremony. And it's our privilege this morning to have Songwoman Marucci perform that for us, followed by the Coolaburra dancers. Songwoman Marucci is actually Fry's a songwoman and a lawmaker. She's a lawwoman who actually is from the Turbula people and the Dipple people in the Sunshine Coast area, this, which is the land that we're on. Songwoman Marucci has had a long and distinguished career in the performing arts, including being the first Aboriginal Australian to perform in the Australian, Australian operatic stage. She'll actually join us to perform traditional blessings according to traditional law to actually welcome us to this space. Please welcome Songwon Mamnaruchi. Yadani Australia Boo. Advance Australia in strength. People of Australia, let us make a good spirit place. For we are from the ancient, we are of the past and the present, and we are, the, we are all the future. That is the English translation of the Australian National Anthem for which I was asked to write for the All-Stars Game here in Brisbane a few years ago, the Indigenous All-Stars Game, and I've since put an extract of the anthem into um, my welcome to country as a statement of reconciliation coming from um, my people. That will be followed by the Brisbane River Dreaming Song and I shall do the blessing of the gathering which is the tradition of the collective of tribes of southeastern Queensland. Yadani Australian Nabayagari Murumbaga Da kolamai ki peranda ngaleyu Bigi numba iki ta milin murumba bulkairi Yadini Australia balandi ko kundu numbuler Balandi ko kundu numbuler Yang indai yango kundai Yan go, balam di go, kundu numbule, balam di go, kundu numbule. Bulkari marumba mi njenu, that's welcome to Brisbane, in the language of that Turubul people, in accordance with the collective of tribes of southeastern Queensland, for which we are a part of. As mentioned before, when we do the welcome to country, it is done as the blessing of the gathering in a song, and I will do that in a tinchy while, but would like to extend the appreciation of the Turubul people to the organizers of this event for having us here in this capacity this morning. I would also like to make a special um, welcome to um, people who've come from uh, overseas to Australia. Hope you have a wonderful time while you're here. Um, with the Brisbane starting to turn on some extra, extra special weather, so. Hope you get to see some um, uh, some of the good things about uh, uh, being Australian. We ourselves, as mentioned, as I mentioned before, with regard to reconciliation, trying to address those issues of the injustice of the past. And I think people on both sides of the uh, divide are gradually, you know, working very hard to address a lot of those issues. So I shall now do the blessing of the gathering, and I hope you have a wonderful time while you're here. Bissel 
That is, rise up, put your feet on the ground. Always keep your feet on the ground. Look to the sunrise, to the sunset. Dinangja, dinangja, feet on the ground. When you rise up, you are walking in somebody else's ground. Maramalanga, 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 maye mediri, maye mediri, maye mediri, birel bilingo, birel bilingo, birel bilingo, wadoge. Wadoge, wadoge, mara malanga, mara malanga, mara malanga, may mediri, may mediri, may mediri, birel bilingo, birel bilingo, birel bilingo, wadoge, wadoge, wadoge. As we work and we collect our food, we give thanks to Mayi, to Birel, who created us and given us the land and the food. And we see all you people looking at us. Well, do we? And because of it, we can. Yadam and yiddy yidda, yadam and yiddy yidda, yadam and yiddy yidda, bimba, 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 bimba. Bimba bimba bimba, yadam and yiddy yidda, 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 bimba bimba bimba, bimba bimba bimba, bimba bimba bimba, ayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayay
And that's how we welcome people. This is the 42nd World Hospital Congress. It's the 21 years since the last Congress was held in Australia. That's a fairly long time. And place is very important in the context of how we work, live, play, understand, grow, and importantly, in relation to specter cultures, respect. To commence proceedings, we're actually going to start with the current president of the International Hospital Federation, Dr. Francisco Ballastrin, who's actually going to give us a chance to hear about the hope for the Congress and also and an opportunity to actually welcome you more formally from the IHF. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Well, the Honorable Stephen Miles, Minister of, of, for Health and Minister for Ambulance Service, Queensland, Australia. The Honorable Greg Hunt, Australian Minister of Health. Dr. Deborah Cole, Chair of the Australian Healthcare and Hospital Association. Board members of the Australian Healthcare and Hospital Association. Delegates from Queensland Health, the host partner of the World Hospital Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to be in Australia for the 42nd World Hospital Congress. Before I start, having been, ha, having been here for nearly a week now, I want to say that I'm in love with this country. I've, been, I've seen wonderful natural beauties, cultural and artistic achievements, and charming hospitality from the Australian people. I think they all deserve a big round of applause as our thank you. Thank you, Australia. We live in a decisive time in healthcare. Today, populations live longer than ever before. In their old age, people are expecting better health and better care at reasonable costs. In the 90th and 20th century, hospital care evolved at tremendous pace. Nursing became an established practice scientifically studying how to help patients best recover. Hygiene and antibiotics made hospitals safer places and allowed new procedures and technologies to happen. Medical devices, such as pacemakers and stents, transformed how we care for the sick. Advances in chemistry, medicine, and genetics have allowed hospitals around the world to become institutions where better health is achieved in a safe and effective manner. In the last two centuries, we have been adapting to all these changes at a rapid pace. Effective management has made hospitals more efficient, and we are able to treat more patients better while using fewer resources. We, also, we are also safer and more reliable institutions today. Processes and protocols, along with the effective use of data, have transformed how we treat our patients, how we measure their progress, and how we evaluated ourselves. However, we are nearly 18 years into the 21st century, and it's clear that we still have a long way to go. We have been creating organizations that are skilled at, at adapting to change and excellent in providing care. But it is perhaps our turn to lead the way in innovation. I believe that hospitals can lead the next big leap in healthcare quality for the world. It's a leap that will be as important as nursing or antibiotics or safe surgery. Safe surgery. It's our turn to take up the responsibility of improving the health of our communities. Our innovations will probably not, however, take the form of a new molecule or a new device, even if that can be part of what we do. The opportunity that hostels have to transform healthcare is in understanding and changing their role in healthcare. No longer can hostels be a 
sterile ivory tower from which specialists do more and more complex and costly procedures. Hostels must become integrated with their societies, joining governments, other healthcare workers, and other facilities in an effort, effort to not only provide better healthcare, but better health. In healthcare, it is quite often and simple. Early solutions are better than complex and late ones. Hostels in the 20th century become excellent at the late and complex, and many abandon the early and simple. Our responsibility to our patients, however, does not begin at the moment that they come through our doors, nor does it end at the, at the moment that they must uh, they walk out. Our patients are whole individuals, and we must treat them as, as a whole, not as a collection of, uh, of fragments. It's not a, is an easy challenge. To transform what we do, we must transform the system we are in. We need to create value and to be paid for the value that we created. We need reliable, transparent data to support a new system. And we need qualified professionals who are able to make intelligent decisions based on the transformation that can be extracted from the data. What hostels and healthcare need, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what we are discussing in this Congress. We need to innovate and to integrate. For that, we need to discuss how we, how we will be part of our communities, how we will be provide value in this new setting, and how we will support healthcare workers, managers, and decision makers in making the choice that they need to make. I know that most of us are already convinced of this. We are people from all over the world yet that we are united in IHF with the goal of providing better health for the population we care for. If I could make one wish for each person's participation in this, in this Congress, it would be that we leave the Congress with the ability to inspire, to take home what we have learned and to express the message that hostels can do more for our communities that we have a duty to lead the transformation in healthcare and to improve the lives of the citizens under our care. We must remind ourselves that the leadership is a responsibility, not a privilege. I'm already inspired by Australia, and I am sure we will, we will all be inspired by the fantastic content of, on the programming of this Congress. I wish you all an excellent Congress and hope to join you in fulfilling our common responsibility for leading the change in healthcare. Thank you. This Congress in particular has been supported actively by Queensland Health as the host partner, in particular the Clinical Excellence Division. What they've been able to do is provide support to bring together an awesome array of speakers, ideas, concepts, to hopefully challenge, to provoke, to inspire, and to enable us to make the changes that Dr. Balliston has been talking about to treat our patients as whole individuals and also to transform the systems that we are in charge with. To speak about health care in Queensland, I'd now like to introduce the Queensland Minister for Health and Ambul Ambulance Services, the Honourable Stephen Miles. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Let me start by acknowledging <clears throat> the traditional owners of the land we're gathered on today, the Turrbal and Yagara people, and pay my respects to their elders uh, past and present and thank song woman Marucci uh, and her dan dancers for that wonderful welcome to country. I get the opportunity to hear song woman Marucci. Often she hails from a similar part of Brisbane uh, to me, but I am uh, never any less moved uh, by hearing her sing. 
Uh, to uh, Dr. Ballastrin, thank you for that wonderful opening address. To Deborah Cole, the chair of the AHHA. Uh, to Greg Hunt, my federal ministerial uh, counterpart, welcome and thank you for being here. It is not often that a state health minister gets to address an audience that includes the federal health minister, but Greg gets to speak after me, so I'll have to be uh, I'll have to be a bit nice. Um, to everyone here from Queensland Health, uh, I want to thank you not just for being here, but for what you do each and every day on behalf of uh, all Queenslanders. To those who have travelled from elsewhere in Australia uh, and from around the world, welcome. Uh, frankly, I'm a bit surprised that all World uh, Health Congresses aren't held here in Brisbane. Uh, it is, of course, the uh, centre of the universe. Uh, I hope that uh, while you're here, you will take the chance to see some of Queensland's uh, natural assets, world-leading uh, natural assets, like the Whitsundays and Cape York. Uh, if you can't, I hope you come back. If you decide you want to stay, we are always looking for the best and brightest, so please go and see our Queensland health staff uh, in the Trades Hall. We would love to have you. Uh, let me say I am very excited to have the World Hospital Congress uh, here in Brisbane. We are very proud of our health service here in Queensland and that is because we have some of the best doctors, nurses, midwives, health professionals, support and managerial staff uh, anywhere. But we also face uh, challenges, our system faces challenges and you have arrived at a crucial time for us as we find our way through those challenges and this Congress is a great opportunity for us to share what we are doing and to learn from you how we can do better. I tell people I know that health is a priority for our government because we put it on the side of a bus. You can see the bus. Uh, we also know it's a priority because in our last budget alone, we committed more than $18 billion to our public health system for the first time, tipping over 30% uh, of the state budget. And we do that because we believe that all Queenslanders, no matter where they live, deserve access to world-class health care. And that is not easy in a state like Queensland. You know, it takes longer to drive from the Gold Coast to Cairns than it does from London to Budapest. In fact, Cairns is about as far from Brisbane as Melbourne is, but Cairns is only two-thirds the way up the Queensland coast. That means many Queenslanders live closer to another country than they do to their tertiary uh, hospital. Uh, on top of that, us Queenslanders, we eat more, we drink more, we smoke more, uh, we have a higher share of the indigenous population uh, and we are facing the onslaught of an ageing bubble driven by uh, the baby boomers as well as uh, th those advances in uh, life expectancy and all of that is putting significant pressure on our hospital system. We are seeing unprecedented increases in demand for health services uh, and we are seeing that in the context of entering a period where the federal government has resolved to cap funding regardless of uh, increases in demand. To give you a sense of those increases in one year alone, we saw an increase in emergency department presentations from 1.87 million to 1.93 million. The most complex cases those, though, category, categories one to three, increased by 7% in just one year. The system has coped, I think, incredibly well with that unprecedented demand, thanks in large part to our fantastic health workers. A record number of Queenslanders are being seen within clinically recommended times. 99% of all Category 1 patients are seen within two minutes. 75% uh, of all emergency department presentations are either discharged or admitted within four hours, uh, leading the country on that metric. Uh, and we've supported our health workers to deliver those results with a specialist outpatient strategy with uh, what I believe is world-leading telehealth uh, technology, as well as significant new investments into men mental health, but primarily by investing 
in our frontline staff. We've recruited, we're in the process of recruiting 3,500 new nurses. Uh, we have legislated safe nurse to patient ratios, one of the first jurisdictions in the world to do so. We're in the process of recruiting 400 new nurse navigators as well as 100 more midwives so that we can deliver midwife-led continuity models of care uh, in the community. But that brings me to the challenge and where we need your help. How can we continue to deliver more and better healthcare to Queenslanders in that context of an environment where our funding will be capped at a level that could well be lower than demand growth? And so we've settled on a two-pronged strategy. We have settled on, uh, we have determined to focus on uh, two elements, prevention and value. So let me start with uh, prevention. Our flagship obesity prevention campaign, uh, My Health for Life, is already delivering results and led by Diabetes Queensland, uh, we think we have some things to share with you there. Our uh, program to deliver health promotion to our Indigenous communities, Deadly Choices, uh, is also fantastic. Uh, it's about using the power of the greatest game of all, Rugby League, to help Indigenous Queenslanders to make better uh, health choices. Uh, we are investing in improving our childhood vaccination rates across the state. We are very close to our target of 95% uh, um, uh, vaccinations at the particularly the five-year uh, level, but there are pockets of the state where it is uh, much lower and that is a significant risk. And so we have uh, deployed a uh, team to do outreach work in those communities where there is an anti-vaccination sentiment not with the goal of vaccinating the children of anti-vaxxers, but with the goal of increasing those uh, hesitant and uncertain, the rate of vaccination amongst those hesitant and uncertain families because we believe that is uh, possible. Uh, and we also have a focus on uh, mental health. The suicide rate in, <coughs> in our state is an ongoing tragedy, uh, an ongoing tragedy that must be addressed. So that's our focus on prevention, um, I want to talk about uh, value because I know that's a focus of uh, this Congress, I know it's the topic for today, and I also know that there's been a lot of talk about value, and uh, I have a view that it's time that we stop piloting value initiatives and start just rolling them out. Because for me, the value agenda is all about delivering every possible element of improvement in health and well-being we possibly can for that $18 billion we are investing, $18 billion we are investing in the health of Queenslanders. Uh, we are well-placed to deliver the kind of disruption that our system needs. Uh, the uh, last 10 years, we've invested more than a billion dollars uh, in uh, hospital digitalization. Um, Metro South Health Service became the first hospital network in the country to go fully digital. By 2020, 80% of all Queenslanders will be serviced from a digital hospital with Sunshine Coast and Ipswich to be the next two to roll out the IEMR. And we are already seeing results in terms of patient outcomes. An 88% reduction in pressure injuries. A 37% reduction in hospital acquired infections. Reduced medication errors, reduced falls, reduced lengths of stay. But the next opportunity is to use the data that we are collecting each and every day in those hospitals to deliver better value. We are working with uh, Professor Adam Elshorg to identify the first 10 low or no value uh, interventions uh, and to work with our clinicians to eliminate those. They represent 6,000 episodes of care within our health service, 16,550 bed days, tens of millions of dollars that can be redirected to higher uh, value care. And I've got to say, uh, as an incoming health minister, I was trepidatious about a program which uh, told doctors that some of what they've been doing, perhaps for a very long time, don't deliver patient improvements. I've got to say, 
uh, I've been heartened by the response of our clinicians. Uh, Often they've expressed relief in being supported to explain to patients what their best options are and what the likely outcomes are, even if sometimes that means telling them that they should do nothing. But the next frontier is using that data to eliminate unwarranted variations, unwarranted variations in cost, uh, in patient outcomes, uh, in readmissions uh, and quality generally. And we're working with Professor Ross Crawford uh, to use that data to show to individual clinicians, health service teams and hospitals where they sit on all of those uh, metrics. For the first time we can say to a clinician, uh, this is you, this is where you sit in terms of your patient outcomes. One senior surgeon, when presented with a graph like this, said, you know, I never thought of myself as an average doctor before. And of course, half of them are below average. The important thing is that we are using this data not in a punitive way, but to help everyone lift themselves to the mean and in the process improve the mean. And that is why we are ensuring the process is peer-driven. Across a first group of five or six specialties, we will appoint a champion who will travel the state armed with this data to talk to clinicians and their teams about what's going on elsewhere in the state and how they can shift themselves to and above the mean. We will provide them with data like this, which is, the, uh, which is patient outcomes for two different types of prosthesis we continue to use both of them. I'm not picking on our uh, orthopods here. Across every profession, there are examples like this. We are inspired by the work of the Getting It Right the First Time program at the National Health Service and grateful for their assistance here. So it's all about, all about delivering better patient outcomes for what is and will increasingly be a limited health spend. I've taken you through just a few of the initiatives that we are focused on uh, in the value agenda. But if you have uh, experience of uh, any of these, please do share those with us today. Because while I, I know that some of the challenges we face in Queensland are unique to us and unique to a state like Queensland, many of them are universal. That's why this Congress is so important. It's why I'm so pleased to have you all here today and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to Brisbane and to help open the Congress. I hope you have a fantastic three days. Thank you, Minister Miles. Uh, The centre of the universe. Let's see what we can do being placed in the centre of the universe. As uh, Minister Miles was referring to, value is an important concept that we will be exploring in particular over the next three days. And as we know, it has different meanings depending upon who you ask. Which actually brings me to a couple of clarifications in Minister Miles' presentation in terms of language. You might have noticed that Australians have the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Bear with us on that one. And the other term is the use of deadly choices. For those of you who are not familiar with the uh, Aboriginal uh, use of the word deadly, it means the equivalent of young people's, that was sick. So just so you know, that's an important cultural uh, uh, clarification that deadly choices mean cool choices. Okay. Now we have the opportunity to actually hear from the chair of the AAHA, the Australian Healthcare and Hospitals Association, Dr Deborah Cole, who's actually going to take us further into this Congress space and warm you to some of the key themes that we'll be covering over the next three days. Deborah. Thank you, Ursula. Um, Before proceeding, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the terrible people and the Yuggera people. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are here today. So on behalf of the Australian Healthcare and Hospital Association, I'd also like to thank Songwoman Maruchi for her 
great welcome to country. Um, it was a very heart-rendering um, thing, and I love the, the dancing um, younger people too. That was great. Um, thank you also to the President of the International Hospital Federation, Dr Francisco Balstrin, um, for your kind words just now, and to the Federation's Governing Council, most of whom are with us today. I acknowledge the Queensland Minister for Health, uh, the Honourable Stephen Miles, um, and thank him for his kind words of support. Um, and more than that, thank him for his commitment and the support of Queensland Health as our partner in this Congress. And thank you to the Department's staff who have been essential in holding um, and running this event. I also acknowledge the presence of the Australian Government's Minister for Health, um, the Honourable Greg Hunt, for his personal support as well and willingness to help us promote this Congress across the world, and that's very much appreciated. So um, last time um, we had the World Hospital Congress, it was in Taipei last year, and I wore a silly hat and promised I'd wear one the whole way through this Congress. So here we are today, and part of going with the big hat is you get to say, g'day. And so I'm here to say that to all of you today. That's a very traditional Australian welcome. So for all of you from overseas, before you leave, I expect you to go and buy an Australian iconic hat at a Kubra, and you have to walk around saying g'day for the rest of the time that you're here. Um, some of your accents might make it a bit amusing to other Australians, but that's okay. We'll, we'll laugh with you. Um, so to those of you from Australia um, and to those of you from all over the world, um, welcome very much to this Congress. We have over a thousand people here today um, and that for us in Australia, for those of you that aren't, is a, is a large conference. So thank you very much for that. So welcome to Australia. It's the land down under um, and especially to Brisbane, Queensland where they say that weather is beautiful one day and perfect the next. And not only that, this venue and the city um, itself is pretty impressive as well. Um, and for most of you that have been here, it's a great day today, both inside and out. Although on my first day here, I managed to get seriously drenched. Um, and I hope that none of you get to experience that as well. But there are plenty of umbrellas. So when I talk, talk about the inside part of it, um, I'll tell you a bit about the programs. We have um, a very exciting and amazing lineup of speakers for you across the next three days. There are 166 speakers, to be precise, across 46 sessions and from more than 40 different countries. We will also have over 100 academic posters on display. So we promise some pretty high quality presentations, discussions and posters, um, that will bring you earlier insights and broader perspectives than you get anywhere else right now, which truly makes this 42nd World Hospital Congress, we think, the most exciting event on the world health care calendar in 2018. So we're thinking big. But none of this is actually possible without the sponsors. And so I'm going to acknowledge all of the sponsors for their support. So I'd particularly like to thank our platinum sponsor, Novartis Australia, our exhibition lounge sponsor, Synthetic Biologics, um, the gala dinner sponsor, Telstra Health, Aussie Sundowner sponsor, Zuki, Silver sponsor, The Naus Group, keynote speaker sponsors, Bupa Australia and Medtronic, the bronze sponsors, Healthcare Denmark, GS1 Australia and Prego Australia, feedback sponsor, Push My Button, S scholarship sponsors, AHHA, Hester and the Leutcher Institute, our award sponsors, Dr. Kwon Tae Kim, OSCO Communication Systems, BioNexo and EOH South Africa. Our notepad sponsor, McGill University, PIN sponsor, Vanguard Health, and media partners, Asian Hospital and Healthcare Management and Health Management org, org Leadership Community. So it's a pretty impressive list of sponsors, and I'm sure you'll agree, a worthy show of appreciation. You'll also find a wide range of other innovative companies in our, our trade exhibition, and I encourage you to visit them all over the next three days and learn how they can support your work and efforts to deliver more efficient, safe and high-quality healthcare. At the Australian Healthcare and Hospital Association, we have worked very, very hard over the last 12 months with the International Hospitals Federation, our supporters, Queensland Health, and many others to bring you an event that will not be 
only be professionally fulfilling, but will leave you with memories that you'll treasure forever, and particularly relationships that you'll treasure forever. And I'd especially like to acknowledge the organising committee, including the Queensland Health team, led by Dr Wake, John Wakefield. I'd also like to show my strong appreciation for the wonderful program put together by the Congress's scientific committee, led by Dr Paul Dugdale. And in particular, I want to acknowledge the at times Herculean efforts of the AAHA's Congress organiser, coordinator and leader, Lisa Roby. For the past 12 months, Lisa has lived, breathed and even dreamed this conference after participating in many 3am conference calls with overseas colleagues. So congratulations, Lisa, Lisa, for a job extremely well done and thanks in advance for what I'm sure will be a wonderful Congress. So I'd like to just ask you to give your appreciation to all of those players, please. So lastly, um, thank you to all of our speakers and staff and delegates for investing your time, energy and resources into this great event. Before I give a little bit more detail about the program, I just want to discuss and pass on my condolences to John Diebel's family. He passed away on the weekend after a long illness, and in Australia, John was one of the architects of our universal health system, and we as a community owe him a lot. And, so I th and he's been a very much a part of the AHA community um, since its inception, so we do pass on our condolences. The Congress's program was designed so we could dive in and unpack the themes of value-based healthcare, integrated care beyond the four walls of the traditional hospital, and developing the data and technology that we need to transform healthcare systems to meet 21st century needs. Colleagues, we are at the cusp of big changes in healthcare services around the world that will bring great benefits to patients and families, as well as to clinical staff and administrators. Through the knowledge gained and the friendships formed here, I know we'll be part of making this future happen. So please enjoy the Congress sessions. Don't hold back from joining in the valuable discussions. Make sure you visit all the exhibition hall whenever you have a spare minute. Um, have the best time, learn lots, and be inspired to take the next step in improving healthcare services wherever you are. So thank you for that, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce Australia's Minister for Health, the Honourable Greg Hunt, MP. Thanks very much to, uh, to Deb Cole and to uh, Alison uh, Verhoeven from the AAHA, uh, to Ursula for her introduction, in particular to uh, Songwoman Marucci and to uh, all of our Indigenous dancers. You know, I was fortunate, uh, indeed, with Stephen Miles, uh, recently to go to Alice Springs where we focused the Australian ministers on the needs of Indigenous Australians with regards to their preventive health, uh, their current health needs and their future health. And we were able to see amazing initiatives such as Purple House which is providing dialysis uh, of and by and for Indigenous Australians. And to see that leadership and to see that transformation is to recognise that whilst we have a huge Indigenous health gap to close, we are making deep, profound progress. But there is much more to be done on that front. To Stephen Miles, uh, whom uh, I've mentioned, thank you for, for your work and your welcome. Uh, to Dr uh, Francisco uh, Balestrin from the uh, IHF, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to Brazil in a moment, uh, and to uh, Francesco Colombo, uh, from uh, the OECD, and to all, all of our international and Australian guests, welcome to the World Hospitals Congress here in Brisbane, in Queensland, and in Australia. Francesco, you uh, said that you love Australia. Uh, I have to say, most Australians, virtually every Australian, loves Brazil. And uh, I, I was, I've, I've been lucky enough to visit Brazil, uh, once, and uh, I have pledged to my 13-year-old daughter, who is a fan of the Amazon, that we will go back at some stage. And in my time there, I was there for a, a work meeting some years ago in the private sector. I did sneak out, and uh, I was hang gliding uh, over Rio de Janeiro, which remains, at the same time, both one of the most exciting and memorable events of my life, but also one of the most terrifying. 
Uh, but uh, we welcome you and we acknowledge your leadership and everything that the IHF has done. So to turn to this conference, Francesco, you started with the nurses. And I think it's very important to acknowledge the work of our nurses for two reasons. One, as, as Health Minister, to see in each of our hospitals the indispensable and fundamental work that they do. But two, as the son of a nurse and as the husband of a nurse, I would be in a lot of trouble if I didn't do that. And uh, they do an amazing, an amazing job. And I think it's very important that uh, as we look at our hospitals, we always think, of how we attract, how we retain, and how we develop our nursing staff as the front line within our hospitals. So that then brings me to what I want to discuss and address with you today, and to, uh, to share and to provide a basis for exchange during the course of the, uh, the coming days over the uh, duration of the Congress. Uh, and that is to take the Australian model and to look at what we're doing well, but to take your models and to look at what we can do better, because that's ultimately what value for this Congress is about, but it's also about adding value to each of our health systems. So to give you a bit of a, a structure of the Australian health system and the long-term national health plan to start with, to then look specifically at our hospitals, but then at the medical research which will help transform patient care and hospital care over the coming decades. Our system, uh, in terms of its status and outcomes, uh, was recently ranked by the Commonwealth Fa Foundation in New York as the number two health system in the world. We were number one, and we are number one, for clinical outcomes, which is a testimony to the work of our doctors and our nurses, our researchers, our hospital administrators, uh, and, dare I say it, uh, governments of all persuasions that have come together and helped develop that system. Uh, I think that's an extraordinary thing. We are dragged down from being number one to number two by the fact that our equity uh, in terms of remote, regional, rural and indigenous is number eight. So we know where we have to do a lot better work. That's uh, a, an honest discussion uh, in a small closed forum amongst a few friends. Uh, but that is, that is uh, I think, a very important thing for all of us to do this week, and that's to be as honest as we can about our strengths and our weaknesses and our learnings and our opportunities. So then, moving from that, the size of the system, uh, it's broken up that the Australian government contributes uh, uh, almost $100 billion. This year, $99 billion, uh, then $102, $104, and then $109 billion over the course of the next four years to healthcare within Australia. Within that, our contribution uh, to hospitals goes from 21 to 22 to 23 to 24 billion dollars, uh, which is up 50 percent on uh, where it was when we when we came into government. But the real point here is that you have a mixed system within Australia, mixed in two ways: uh, you have federal and state, and you have public and private. And across the whole of the country, what we have is 42 uh, percent federal funding. 25% state and 33% private. And that private is broken up roughly half to private health insurance and roughly half to, uh, to direct contributions by, uh, by patients. And you, people will have differing views about different systems, but I think for Australia that hybrid model actually is a profoundly important one because we have incentive for our medical professionals on the one hand, uh, we have a universal system both of hospital and of uh, primary health care coverage and medicines coverage uh, on the other hand, and together they, they form a very important uh, f philosophical base for the Australian system. And Deb, I'm very glad that you acknowledged John Deeble today. It's a great loss, but what a life, what a contribution that he made. So then, uh, if you move to beyond the numbers, what are the themes and the structures? Our long-term health plan uh, for Australia is built around four pillars. Firstly, primary care, uh, and that's uh, about our doctors and our nurses, for those from uh, overseas. Uh, our universal health care model in Australia is called, is called Medicare, uh, and our funding for that, and it doesn't really matter what the numbers are, but it's 25, 26, 27, 29 billion dollars a year over the next four years. But what it does is that it means that Australians are able to access their doctors, to get their health cover. We're currently working with the AMA, the Australian Medical Association, and the College of GPs uh, on an optional model 
within that uh, where instead of just having a fee for service, patients and doctors may elect in where they can have an alternative model of not just a face-to-face -face encounter with the, uh, the doctor. And so here I take Stephen's points uh, about the way the hospitals will work. To build in telehealth, to build in online, to build in uh, uh, telephone, to build in the ability to work with the practice nurse and to therefore reward the doctor for that service, but to provide the patients with the options that they have in dealing with other professions. If you do want to deal with a lawyer, you can use all of those avenues. If you uh, want to deal uh, with somebody in business or elsewhere, you can use all of those avenues. And yet, uh, because we have an older model, uh, we have largely precluded those. So that's a big change in the value proposition for patients and for doctors, entirely on an optional basis for each of the patients and the practices. But that's what we're working on and evolving now. It's about modernising that system. At the same time, uh, in the same way that Queensland is doing that review of value within their hospitals, within our primary care system, we're reviewing all of the 5,800 Medicare items uh, led by some of Australia's great, uh, great clinicians. And they're looking at what's working, what's not working, what's missing, and what can be, uh, what can be improved. And so you have a difficult process, but a clinician-led process uh, to update and modernise uh, modernize that system. Same time, one of our great breakthroughs uh, has been to uh, list 1,900 newer amended medicines over the last five years. Uh, and these medicines can sometimes be you know, coming to the cost of a billion dollars, but we've been able to make the, uh, the economic case so as every new medicine that the medical experts, or what's in Australia called the Pharmaceutical Benefits and Advisory Committee recommends, we will list. And whether it's a billion dollar uh, hepatitis C program, uh, whether it is uh, $700 million for a new medicine for breast cancer called Kiskali that many of you will be aware of and hopefully some of you here to help develop and pioneer, uh, whether it's uh, a breakthrough medicines for beautiful kids with spinal muscular atrophy uh, called Spinraza or uh, medicines for cystic fibrosis such as Orcambi. These are literally the stories of lives that can be changed. Um, in, our, in our hospitals, uh, which I'll come to in a moment, that's our second pillar from the primary uh, to the acute setting. The structure we have is public and private and private health insurance supporting it for 55% of the population. Uh, I'll, I'll go into that in a little more detail in a second, but that structure is very much the Australian model and each of you from overseas will judge whether it would work for you or whether there are elements that you would uh, take from our... Uh, from our system. Thirdly, there is uh, mental health. And today, of course, is World Mental Health Day. And as part of that, uh, we are announcing today that the Australian Government will implement a $125 million, 10-year, uh, Million Minds Mental Health Research Program. And this program uh, will be led uh, by extraordinary leaders such as the great uh, uh, Indigenous clinician, Professor Helen Milroy. Uh, uh, Prof uh, Professor Kapoor, uh, the Dean of Medicine, uh, psychiatrist by profession at the University of Melbourne, uh, the great Patrick McGorry and uh, Tracy Wade, an expert in eating disorders, Ian Hickey and others. And its first three areas of focus, I'm delighted to announce, uh, will be eating disorders, which can affect up to a million Australians, but has largely been one of the buried areas in terms of mental health coverage within Australia. Secondly, youth mental health challenges, and thirdly, and very importantly given uh, our opening discussions today, Indigenous mental health challenges. So it's a very important step on what we do. Then we turned uh, to medical research as the fourth of our pillars, and I'll now explore in a little more detail our hospitals and our medical research and what we've learned from overseas and vice versa. In terms of our hospitals, on the public side, we have about 695. Uh, for us, that's uh, over 60,000 uh, beds in operation. And uh, I mentioned our funding uh, a little bit earlier, but it's gone from about 13.3 million when we came in uh, to 21 million this year, then 22, 23, and, uh, a billion, 22, 23, and 24 billion dollars uh, a year going forward. 
But most significantly, um, the work that we are doing with the states as part of the new hospital uh, reform agreement, six of the eight states and territories have uh, signed up and uh, for the last full year our funding was uh, grew at 6.2% real funding and the states were about 0.1% real funding increases according to the Institute of Health and Welfare. But most significantly uh, there's a major increase, a $30 billion increase in funding, but accompanied by uh, many of the types of reforms that Stephen outlined, but we want to take those nationally and we want to expand them around a simple value concept. And that is, the most successful, successful hospital treatment is the one that never happens. The most successful treatment is the one that never happens, where uh, if we can work in a relationship between primary carers and our hospitals and prov provide an incentive structure uh, so as the uh, primary carers benefit and the hospitals benefit from co uh, collaborative programs to ensure that there are better outcomes and we can reward those outcomes, uh, then ultimately it's the patient that benefits if he or she uh, is able to either not uh, have to enter hospital or stay in the hospital for a lesser period of time uh, and uh, be able to receive their, uh, their treatment as an outpatient. That is vastly the preferable case wherever possible. Of course, we will always have hospitals that have uh, that are full, um, uh, and you know we bat we plan together to prepare for that. But this change with telehealth, with point of care testing, uh, with out uh, with outpatient treatment, is the very transformative moment that's occurring, not just in value care, but in patient outcomes in Australia. I saw this recently at the Texas Medical Centre to look at one hospital system overseas. They looked at us and thought there were things that we did very well, but we were able to look at what they were doing in outpatient care uh, and the use of the, the multi-channels, the telehealth, the, uh, the outpatient work, uh, and to say, well, we can do more of that in this country. Uh, beyond that, uh, on the private uh, side, the, the private hospitals also play a critical role in Australia. Just over 630 overnight and day hospitals in Australia uh, we have over 30,000 uh, hospital beds within those, uh, within those private hospitals. And they're underpinned by a private health insurance model which has 55% enrolment in Australia. Challenges on that? So we've embarked upon a process of simplification so there are no surprises when people come in. And if they have no surprises, and if we're able to uh, reduce the cost, we've just reduced the cost to the lowest point in 17 years in terms of changes, then we'll maintain the prevalence of it, and if we maintain the prevalence, we take pressure off the public hospitals by giving people the option of the private uh, and everybody benefits. So that's, that's our fundamental structural task in, as well as the reform of care task. So that's what we're doing on the hospital side. The outcomes are pretty good. Uh, 82.5 uh, years of life expectancy, number five in the OECD but we must lift our Indigenous life expectancy and our Indigenous outcomes. Uh, we have a smoking rate of uh, 12%, uh, again, the, uh, about the fourth uh, lowest in the OECD, and a youth smoking rate of 5.5%, roughly half of the OECD average. So these are immensely important outcomes, but more can be done. And that's where medical research comes in, which is the last thing I want to address very briefly. We've been fortunate to put in place a $20 billion endowment, uh, which will mean that medical research in Australia will double under what's called the Medical Research Future Fund. And the two things that I want to highlight today, firstly, is we aim to make Australia a global centre for clinical trials. And there's a quarter of a billion dollar rare cancers, rare diseases, clinical trials program. Uh, shortly today, uh, we will be making another announcement in relation to that. And that's related to our missions as well under the Medical Research Future Fund. And our missions involve transforming hospital care is one, uh, the Million Minds Mental Health Mission, but the Australian Brain Cancer Mission as well, where we have a 10-year, $110 million mission uh, to uh, double life expectancy from brain cancer by helping to lead the world and with the uh, Queensland Children's Foundation uh, we, uh, we Research Foundation, we will very shortly be making an announcement on that today. Finally, the great transformative area of healthcare will be personalised healthcare, 
genomics, the sequencing of our DNA, the ability to find what is different and unique in each of us and to tailor that treatment. So for us, we've made that the centrepiece of our medical research over the course of a decade with a half a billion dollar investment. And that is about, at the end of the day, ensuring that each child and each parent and each senior Australian has the opportunity to have tailored care. Nothing will transform medicine uh, on this scale, arguably, uh, since antibiotics. So it's a great moment, always challenging. But you bring your expertise, you bring your skill, you bring your ideas. I want to thank you, I want to honour you, I want to welcome you. And I, with that, am delighted to officially declare open the World Hospitals Congress for 2018. Thank you, Minister Hunt. I have to say I was intrigued by your hang gliding experience and it, it strikes me as a useful metaphor in a way to what we're trying to do here. It's hang gliding has that factor of courage. We need to be curious enough to actually even consider it as an option. And we also need to be willing to take calculated risks. Healthcare is very similar to that. And also the key thing is our adaptability or our capacity to build adaptability into the systems that we are both part of and we are seeking to shape. The other thing it is, it's an eyes, eyes open activity, although I'm sure depending how you're going, whether you have your eyes open or not when you're actually hang gliding. The point here is that it's also there are more a multi-sensory activity, which is what healthcare provision is, but also healthcare planning. So what I'm going to encourage you to do, as has our speakers this morning so far encouraged us to do, is actually bring all of our senses to this experience and over the next three days to actually engage broadly and multisensorily so we can actually get a grip on that hang glider and actually enjoy the ride. Now, Francesco Colombo, who's the head of the health division of the OECD, was going to be our next speaker in person, but alas, she's not been able to physically be present. But thankfully, thank, thanks to the uh, power of modern technology, we've been able to actually bring her in spirit. So there's actually a video of her presentation now. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted of the opportunity to offer the OECD perspective at this very important meeting today. Now, we all know that hospitals are really key to delivering valuable services to patients, but we also know that hospitals are under a very, very significant pressure today. They need to demonstrate, really, that they deliver services which are in line to what are the needs of uh, the population. And the hospital landscape is also really changing. We see a proliferation of out-of-hospital service models. We seek to avoid, actually, admissions in the first place. And sometimes we really see the admission to hospital as a failure of health systems. So in this perspective, more than ever before, there is really need to demonstrate that hospitals deliver value in the health system and that they are no longer just a, um, a place where there are activities and there are costs. And I would like to really offer the OECD perspective in this respect. Let me start by looking at a broader picture. There are a number of uh, factors which are putting really pressure on health systems. There are many. There are raising inequalities, for example, within countries, across countries, across different population groups. There is a very tight uh, fiscal environment and the need really to contain costs. There are pressures that come from aging societies that you are all very much uh, aware of. There are changes in risk factors and worrisome uh, uh, unhealthful uh, behavior as well. And there is a been or there's been a somewhat a policy failure to address some of the challenges that health systems face uh, in this respect. This can be really very much seen by uh, the trends. If we look at the trends uh, in, in health spending, we know that uh, there has been a financial crisis, and the financial crisis has resulted in a significant reduction in GDPs, as you can see at the top of this, uh, uh, of this slide. And this has been also uh, led to some uh, uh, cuts in, uh, in health spending or slowdown in health spending in the short term. But in the more longer term, we now see a resumption in health spending growth, which is more in line with GDP. The pressure, however, is there for the future. We know that uh, uh, all the projections, if we don't take any measure, any reform, point to a more than a doubling on health spending as a share of GDP into the future. 
So the question would be really, how do we make sure that this does not affect our health system? And there is indeed a risk that we lose track of what health systems are all about, and this is what I would like to address today. We know that we need to deliver to what uh, um, politicians, to what uh, uh, patients, uh, to what uh, providers want, and sometimes we don't really take care of understanding what the individuals need, and these lights and this uh, figure is quite telling. It's a patient that says to the doctor, let me know if you want uh, why, to know why you're here. And my uh, talk today is that we need to reconfigure health system dramatically so that they are oriented to do, towards the needs of patients and not simply what providers can do or what we think that works better. So my, I would like to suggest four uh, possible areas for uh, transformation of health system to make sure that we are on track with this goal. The first issue is that there is really a need to cut on waste in health systems. We at OECD have done significant work which has shown that, unfortunately, there is a very significant share of health spending that is ineffective at best or even at, waste, at worst wasteful, so it does not deliver any value. There are many, many areas of those, and so they are highlighted in these slides. Uh, just a few adverse events occur in one in 10 hospitalizations across OSPD countries, generating a lot of costs. And what is important to note is that a lot of that can be avoided. There are significant geographical variations uh, across the countries, which are hard to justify. Uh, there are even a very large uh, prescription and utilization of antimicrobial. Uh, many of which uh, are inappropriate. And uh, we see that use of the emergency departments in many cases is also inappropriate. So ample waste in health systems that could definitely be uh, reduced. So the first really issue is to make sure that we deliver value is really to cut some of these uh, um, waste in the health system. The second area which I would like to point to you is the need to address uh, variations. Uh, today, there are, we measure quite a lot so what happens both nationally and internationally, and these data reveal that there is significant variations in the quality and outcomes across countries and also within countries. So this can be illustrated, for example, in these slides. This graph shows the rate of death within 30 days of patients which were admitted to hospitals after an IMI. And so what is striking here, first the good news perhaps, is that we see over time that in all the countries there has been a significant improvement in the quality of care. This is the good news. But at the same time we see that there is a significant, a five-fold uh, variation in outcomes across countries and it's quite unclear why this happened. If we look even uh, farther, even more strike is the fact that there is a significant variation in outcomes even within countries. And here is it is collecting data at uh, hospital level that shows for the same indicator what is the variations within a country. So there are a number of questions really that come up. Uh, the first is why there is so much variation uh, with Sweden and Finland, for example, having much less variation than what happened in Latvia or in Korea. And that's at first questions. But there is also uh, questions that uh, arise about what is behind this figure. So preliminary analysis that we are done at OECD shows that this is very much linked to uh, the volume and the more there is volume of care which is delivered, the less there is variations. But there can be other factors. There can be issues that could be related to case loads, uh, does ownership of hospitals or teaching status, or uh, other factors, location and so forth, explain such variations. I think we need to shed much more light on these issues. We are doing some work at OECD on these. The third area that, uh, where I think uh, change ought to happen is uh, to put better data to work. Right now in health system, we do have so many data which are generated on a daily basis from the encounter that happens in hospitals, in uh, uh, primary care systems, uh, and so forth. But we have very little opportunity to generate value from, uh, from this data. And uh, we know that data could be used for many important things to improve, for example, uh, the clinical practice 
or even for looking at disease surveillance or think about the possibility of system management or again the possibilities of having research. All of these opportunities are there if we are able to leverage data which are personal, they are therefore sensitive, but that they can offer a very, very powerful uh, picture of what happens to health system. So obviously putting this data to work because they are personal and they are sensitive require having the, the right uh, infrastructure and require having the, the right data governance. But they really per, uh, permit the opportunities to capture in a more uh, integrated way what happens in health system from the hospitals to uh, the patients uh, um, in primary care sector and so forth. So hospitals must really be looking at linkages of outcomes data across the full uh, pathway from the community to the hospitals and even to long-term care and vice versa. And uh, routine data linkages as well as uh, uh, the evolution of electronic medical records offer tremendous possibility for this data integration and a better picture of what happens in health systems. The last issue that I would like to suggest is really the need to put hospital very much at the centers. We collect so many data on utilizations, on uh, expenditure, on what goes in health system, the inputs, but we have very little understanding of the full range of outcomes that really matter for our patients. And let me give you an example of what we have today. This uh, uh, graph just shows the evolution rates of uh, knee replacements uh, across countries. And what we see, obviously, is that there is a very, very significant variation, but the question is, is this variation justified? Is it that some countries are providing too little, or is it that some countries are providing too, too much? Is the fact that there has been an increase over time simply due to aging population or what? So to really understand whether we are on right track or not, we should be measuring different things. We need to understand the full range of outcomes that matter really to patients, in this case, the patients that undergo a knee replacement. There are some countries that are starting to do so. If we look at these graphs, for example, um, it's again looking at, uh, at knee replacement and some of the procedures and surgery. But in this case, what is measured is different things. It's things that are related to what matters uh, to patients, quality of life, uh, for example. And this type of graph clearly show, show, uh, give information which is importable not only for an individuals to uh, facilitate their choice, but also ultimately for policymakers and clearly for a clinician to understand if they are on the right track. So I'm arguing that to achieve really better value, we need better information. We need information about uh, whether individuals are able to live independently, for example, after a stroke or uh, after a mental health uh, uh, instance, or whether they have a very good quality uh, of life, or even understand what is their patient's uh, experience of, the, of their care. So it's really understanding to collect this information, and there is no better uh, person to know this information than the patient themselves. So asking the patients is the next uh, step in our journey to value. This is why also OECD has embarked in a, an important initiative, which is called the Paris Initiative, the Patient Reported Indicator Survey, which is an initiative that will collect in a more systematic way information on outcomes and experiences for patients for specific conditions, but also develop a new international surveys of patient experience for individuals with chronic conditions in primary care. So I'm coming to an end now, and I think uh, what I'm arguing today is that we are on an important journey, but the journey is really to open up the value pipeline in a way. So to really move from a volume to a, a different, more nuanced understanding of what value is. And to do this, we need to be accompanied also by a, a pipeline of data, uh, a better data pipeline, uh, which enables us to better understand variation, to better understand why and where there is waste in health system, and to better understand also how to bring data together across different data sets, and that measures what matters to patients in a different way. And ultimately doing this together with other important things such as organizational uh, cultural change or professional cooperation and improvement in governance will really help up uh, opening up uh, the value pipeline. So, 
I'm finishing now. These are my contact details. I really would like to thank you so much for your attention. I'm sure that many of these things you will be uh, discussing and deliberating today. I offer only some food for thoughts. Uh, we have obviously a lot of work still to be done. I think we are on the right track, and I wish you all the best for your uh, deliberations in the coming day. So thank you, Francesca. Interestingly, Francesca's really focusing on the key issue, which is this volume challenge we have in the context of what value means and her points about issues of waste, variation, data or data and outcomes. What are they? Who decides? Which ones matter to who? A very important question, so we want to continue to explore them over the next few days. To continue this conversation, we're actually now moving into uh, a, another keynote, but what I want to do is, is uh, re-emphasise one of Dr Cole's points was actually the importance of recognising our sponsors. Our very first keynote speaker that we have for the conf now officially opened Congress is going to be introduced by our sponsor, Bupa, Bupa Australia. Cindy Shea is the actual Director of Health Partnerships and Innovation, and Cindy will actually introduce our next keynote speaker. Cindy. Thank you, Ursula. Um, on behalf of Bupa Australia, as one of Australia's largest health and care service providers, working in the areas of health insurance, care delivery and aged care, we're delighted to sponsor this next presentation by Professor Elizabeth Ticeberg and welcome her and the team from Dell Medical School to Australia. Now, some of you had the opportunity to um, hear from Elizabeth and the team over the last two days at the workshop. Um, and I can tell you we're all very excited to further debate some of the things that were discussed over the last two days. Professor Ticeberg is the co-creator of the idea of value-based healthcare, strategy and co-author of Redefining Healthcare, Creating Value-Based Competition on Results. Professor Ticeberg serves as the Executive Director of the Value Institute of Health and Care at the New Dell Medical School in Austin, Texas. And I know she is keen for many of us to join and go and visit her in Austin. But please join me in welcoming Professor Elizabeth Ticeberg to the stage. So thank you, Cindy, and um, thank you to Bupa. Uh, good morning, or good day. I'm listening to, to Deb. Good day. Uh, I want to first say thank you to Deb Cole, who showed up in Austin with a ulterior motive of convincing us to uh, come and visit Down Under and succeeded, uh, and also to the AWHA and to all the organizers and sponsors of the conference. I also want to thank all of the people who attended the workshop earlier this week and my colleagues, Professor Alice Andrews and Professor Scott Wallace for delivering a, a great conference this week. Uh, we're looking forward to talking with more of you. If you'd like, we have a uh, reception on Friday morning and you can come and talk with us in person then if you, if you would like to. So I want to talk about transforming healthcare, but I want to start with just the observation that healthcare is personal, that in healthcare, everyone has a story. You do, or you have a close friend or a relative who does. Uh, and they're, they're important stories because quality of life and dignity of death are at stake in these, in these experiences. And of course, I too have stories that were just fundamental to, the, uh, to my life and my family's life. I have two sons who had complex medical situations in their childhood. One needed major surgery just to survive his first week of life. The other uh, spent five years of his childhood in pain seven days a week until we finally got the right diagnosis and uh, were able to heal him with an inexpensive pharmaceutical that we had to import from France. But 
Um, you know, with the wrong diagnosis, everything is waste and harm. And with the right diagnosis, it's amazing how fast the human body can heal with the right treatment. We're blessed both of these young men are healthy, humble, polite, happy, successful adults today. Uh, so we were very lucky about that. But wow, did we learn a lot in the process. First, we encountered just countless healthcare professionals who are smart, caring, hard-working people. Whatever problems we have in healthcare, they aren't for a lack of smarts or a lack of caring. There's phenomenal people in, in the health sector. But in spite of how important it is, and in spite of, of how awesome the health professionals who are dedicating their careers to helping people with their health are, we have highly variable outcomes, we have increasing costs unless we just cap them, and we have slow innovation relative to the rest of the economy. It's so important. How can that be? And how can we let that persist? And that's the puzzle that I use to pull Mike Porter into working on healthcare, to think about why it is that the dynamic in healthcare isn't what we would want it to be in such an important sector of the economy. And to make a very long story very short, in a nutshell, what we found was that the problem is that in healthcare, the attention um, and, the, and, the, and the activity tends to be around shifting costs, around uh, requiring process compliance, or around gaining market share, rather than around what healthcare is fundamentally about, rather than healthcare's purpose. The goal has to be to achieve better outcomes for individuals and for families. The goal has to be better health. We need to re return healthcare to its purpose. So, but when we think about healthcare, traditionally, we've spelled it as one word, and hence it means treatment. But actually, it's two words, health and care. And they're both important, right? But more treatment, as you've been hearing all morning already, is not really the goal. In fact, more treatment is what's happened when we're not succeeding. And most people don't want more treatment. You don't want a few extra days in the hospital. So the real goal is not more treatment, the real goal is more health. And that's how we need to have our, our health systems oriented. For all the talk about cost reduction, it's, it's not, that's not really the goal either. Cost reduction is necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's not enough to deliver today's health care more cheaply. We need health care that works for everyone. If cost reduction were actually the goal, then painkillers and compassion would be sufficient. Really, though, it is about outcomes. And it's not really about the experience either. Like air travel, you don't really go for the experience of it. It needs to get you where you need to be. A low-cost ticket to the wrong place doesn't help. If you'd gotten to the airport on your way here and they'd said, hey, for half the price, we can get you to Perth, you would have been saying, no, we have to get the results that we have to get the results that we need. So value is really about improving the health outcomes, the change in health outcomes that matter to patients for the money we spend. So we can't ignore the spending, but primarily the concept of value is about improving health outcomes. And value is created when an individual or family's health outcomes improve. Notice that that means that if we're not improving the outcomes, the value is zero. Value is fundamentally about improving outcomes. But better outcomes aren't necessarily more expensive. In fact, an important insight is that it is often the reverse. Because living in good health is inherently less expensive than living in poor health. Think about diabetes, type 2 diabetes. 
if it doesn't progress, it's a reversible disease, if it doesn't progress to neuropathy and amputation, it's a better outcome, and that outcome is less expensive. Think about frail elderly people. If we can keep people healthy enough to live independently, it's a better outcome and it's less expensive than hospitalization or nursing home care. Better health is inherently less expensive than poor health. So it's been amazing to me the, the, the change in the conversation from volume to value uh, that I've seen in the, in the course of this work. And it's really, um, it, I, I just can't even tell you how I feel about listening to this big international conference with everyone talking about the need to focus on value. But in fact, we've gotten to the point where, as a couple of the uh, first speakers have already mentioned, we've gotten to the point where it's not just about the trans transition from volume to value. We've actually seen now that we can do high value care and we can do better value care for everyone we serve. So now the challenge is to take high value care and make that high volume. The challenge now is to scale the high value activities and to raise our aspiration to provide high value care for everyone. So healthcare to achieve this needs transformation and as you've heard, it's a big scale transformation that we need. It's like the transformation that you've seen in your phone service over the past couple of decades. You remember that thing on the left? Yeah? Uh, the thing to think about is not just that we've gone from a telephone to a whole ecosystem of services that bring the communications and services you need right to you. And that's what we do need to do in healthcare. Uh, but also to recognize that when you had that corded phone that only made phone calls and required you to stay so close to the wall, when people ask you what innovation it needed, you wanted a longer cord, right? You weren't asking for a whole ecosystem that would bring all the communications you needed right to you. Very few of us looked at that corded black phone and said, gosh, it can't take pictures of my kids in the park. Right? So we need to think much more about what this transformation is, is going to mean and needs to mean. We need to think about how do we bring the state of the art of medical science to local care. That would be a change in a whole ecosystem that allows us to get high value care to everyone who needs it. So let's think about what do we mean by health? Because as people start thinking about needing to improve outcomes, we need to think hard about what do we mean by the outcomes we want to improve. It's not always just a matter of mortality. You don't want your dental cleaning judged by whether or not you survived. What you want is to think more carefully about what are the outcomes that are appropriate to the challenges that you face. So over the past 10 years in the work that I've done with Scott Wallace and now with other members of the Value Institute at Dell Med, we've thought hard about what do individuals and families mean by health and how do we measure meaningful outcomes in this context. And we find that health falls into three big uh, categories and the things we need to measure fall into those categories. So the first is capability. Can you do the things that enable you to be you? And then depending on what, are the, what the health circumstances are that you face, those capabilities may be different. So if you have type 2 diabetes, it may be the ability to use your feet and the ability to see well enough to read. If you're a child with asthma, you want to be able to run and play and make it to school every day and not spend a lot of time in the emergency room or being on the sidelines. So the first is what doctors would call functional outcomes, but what individuals would think of as capability to do the things that make me me. The second category is comfort, reduction in suffering. So physical pain, anxiety, depression, healthcare should offer comfort. 
to improve comfort. And then the third category is calm. Does life go on during care? So think about our health care today. So much of what we do has to do with chronic disease, long-term disease like cancer, congenital conditions, or end of life. So much of what we do has a long time horizon. We need to measure the outcomes during care, not just the outcomes of care, so for capability, comfort, and calm. But when you think about calm, the question is, does the health care we offer induce chaos or mayhem into family life, or does the, do, are we creating health care that supports calm so that life continues with whatever the health challenges are that one faces? Capability, comfort, and calm. The way we measure today too often focuses instead on the question of how were we? How were the health care providers? How was the parking? You know, how was reception? Did you wait too long? Would you recommend me? Net promoter scores. But this is health care. How were we is not a sufficient question. We can't just stop at net promoter scores. Because in health care, the critical question is not how were we, it's how are you? Did we help? And that is the critical question for high value care. How are you? So we need to ask it in more specific ways, of course, with capability, comfort, and calm. But we need to understand that healthcare in that regard is indeed special. So we want to return healthcare to its purpose, to the purpose of helping people to lead and enjoy their lives. And actually, that's what our healthcare providers have come into this career to do. And so for all of the talk about burnout, we need to be refocusing on the purpose of healthcare and the outcomes that we, that we achieve with healthcare, rather than ask our providers to run ever faster on the hamster wheel, rather than monitoring processes with expanding numbers of details in what they have to measure, we should be thinking about measuring the outcomes of care, measuring their success as professionals so that high-value care is supporting professionalism as well as patients or individuals who perhaps never have to become patients because we've provided them with very high-value support for health. So that's what we're about. And if you would like to talk more with us, we're doing a reception on Friday morning here so that you can talk with me and with Professor Andrews and Professor Wallace about the work that we're doing at the uh, Value Institute for Health and Care. What we're doing at the Value Institute really falls into three big categories. One is support for clinical transformation. So we've been working with groups around the world now for more than a decade on making these kinds of transformations and scaling these transformations as we see their success. We're offering a series of unique education programs, everything from the types of workshops that we did earlier this week in Brisbane to a new master's degree in healthcare transformation that provides the uh, support for the skills that you need for, um, for measuring outcomes, for communicating in ways that, that lead to more resilience, for leading teams and for um, pursuing the things that you need for, to deliver high value healthcare. Um, and then third is we're creating a nexus or a hub for healthcare innovators to share their stories because what we find is that there are predictable obstacles that people run into, but they run into them in different orders, and they come up with different solutions. So the ability for people to share their stories, share their successes, and 
counsel each other on how to get around the challenges and barriers um, is another part of the role that, that we're providing. So each of these three, three areas are things that we are, will be happy to discuss more and more specifically with you if you'd like. And with that, what I want to say is thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Lots and lots of food for thought. What I liked was the, the longer phone cord analogy. What we don't know what we don't know, which means we have to move into places of uncertainty and accept the vulnerability that goes with that. And as professionals, we don't like that. But that's part of the transformation process within ourselves that we're trying to facilitate within the systems that we actually work in. The other interesting point there for me was the purpose of healthcare is health. As an emergency physician, we do a lot of disease management, plugging holes, but the purpose of healthcare is health. And at the end of the day, there is an incredible cost benefit, cost in the broadest cost possible sense, of approaching health in that particular way. And the other point, which is actually the point that Elizabeth started with, and it's something we're actually going to explore as we continue. There's a panel session this afternoon that's going to talk about this in a bit more detail, is that health is personal. It's personal for all of us. It's personal for all of the us's that we come in contact with in our own lives, patients, families, etc. It's about stories and it's about listening to those stories and understanding what value means for and with people varies over time and context. So some incredible food for thought. Thank you, Elizabeth.